Hello and welcome back to another video on this channel. It has been a while since the last upload, so it's finally time for the contrastive learning video for which most of you guys voted. Therefore, let's today have a look at what this is in more detail. And this first video is all about the theory and the second one will be about implementation in PyTorch. Contrastive learning is a technique in deep learning that falls under the hood of representation learning. Representations are everything nowadays and if we are able to transform our data into a better format, we can significantly improve the performance of our machine learning algorithms. Deep neural networks are inherently representation learners. From layer to layer, the high dimensional input data is transformed such that we end up with a compact, low dimensional representation, which allows us to separate the feature space much more easily. When we train in a supervised fashion, the embedding space is typically arranged according to our annotations. For example, if we have three classes, the representations could be separated like this. But what do we do if we have no labels? How can we learn meaningful representations of our data without any targets? Contrastive learning is one possibility to do this. And in fact, this method is not limited to unsupervised training, but has also shown success in supervised setups. With contrastive learning, we want to learn representations of data in such a way that similar data points have similar representations in the embedding space. Let's have a closer look at this. The fundamental idea of contrastive learning is instance discrimination. That means we want the model to learn to discriminate data points that belong together from those who don't. In the supervised case, that's straightforward. We can simply use the labels to pick out data points that belong to the same class and those who don't. Research has shown that supervised contrastive learning can produce representations that are able to outperform classical loss functions like cross entropy. It has also shown to be more robust. Even more interesting is unsupervised contrastive learning. In the unsupervised or self-supervised case, we don't have any label information. And therefore, we need to come up with a way to tell the model to discriminate the inputs. For this, data augmentation does the trick. I like to think of augmentations as artificially generating labels by constructing near neighbors. By modifying an original data point, we can generate a positive view of it. For images, these augmentations can be things like cropping, changing colors, rotations, adding noise, and many, many more. The negative samples are then usually all other data points in the dataset, or more specifically, the current batch. Now, there are two important aspects with this strategy. First, the quality of the representations heavily depends on good augmentations. The augmented images need to be close enough to the original image, but still far away from other samples. Secondly, it can happen that we get false negatives. For example, if we have another cat image as a negative instance. There are many variants of self-supervised contrastive learning that already handle these points. We will just have a look at the classical methods here. One open question remains, which is what do we get from these contrasted representations? Typically, labeled data sets are small and the hope is that these representations are generalizable enough such that we can use them for all sorts of downstream tasks. For image data, this includes clustering, segmentation and object detection. Self-supervised contrastive learning has outperformed most of the previous pre-training techniques in recent publications. It's also very popular in the field of natural language processing. Generalizable text embeddings can be used for all sorts of downstream tasks like text classification, question answering or text generation. So to summarize everything we've heard so far, contrastive learning helps us to learn compact representations and in addition to that gives us the possibility to learn from unlabeled data, which is the most common form of data. The idea of contrastive learning is out there for a long time already and dates back to 1992. A publication by Becker and Hinton shows for the first time how to learn in a contrastive sense using pairs of data as input. Another group of popular researchers presented Siamese networks, which also have the comparison of data points at the core. Nowadays, there are many popular frameworks for contrastive learning, of which I've picked out two that I'll quickly want to talk about here. The first one is SimCLR or SimClear, 
which stands for Simple Contrastive Learning Framework. From plain unlabeled data, it achieved similar performance as the supervised variant on the ImageNet dataset. That means the learned representations were such transferable that it didn't even need labeled data. They present a special contrastive loss function and a strategy to build positive and negative pairs, which we'll have a look at in a second. Besides that, they emphasize the importance of right data augmentation for successful contrastive learning and combine multiple augmentations to create positive views. Another interesting publication is called CLIP. It applies the contrastive idea jointly on image and text data. The positive pairs are images and text that belong together, and the negative ones are all other combinations in this matrix. Following this approach, the learned representations outperform many existing methods on ImageNet tasks. CLIP is however not a self-supervised approach because we already know the positive and negative image text pairs and therefore don't need any augmentations to generate them. Now that we've heard some of the prominent examples, let's dive a bit deeper and look at some loss functions. Let's first talk about what the intuition behind the contrastive loss function is. As mentioned before, we pass different views of images through a neural network and obtain output representations which are denoted with hi and hj here. A contrastive loss function operates on those embedding pairs and measures the similarity or distance between them. This is also called metric learning because we operate on the data points directly instead of comparing some classification results. This is done in such a way that the similarity of positive pairs is high and the similarity of negative pairs is low. As a consequence, our model will need to ignore irrelevant differences in the input space and needs to learn what makes images similar and dissimilar. There are plenty of implementations of different loss functions and for a great overview I recommend this survey paper which I've linked in the video description. In the following we will take a closer look at a few popular contrastive loss functions. The beginning of all contrastive loss functions is probably the loss function with exactly this name, the contrastive loss presented in 2005. Its basic idea is to pull similar data points together and push dissimilar ones away, a bit like it's done by clustering algorithms. Let's say we have the output embedding for this cat image and now want to have the positive augmentation of the image close to it and all other data points far away. Mathematically, this can be formulated using the indicator function. The loss is split into a positive pair loss in green and a negative pair loss in red. The indicator function is basically an if-else block based on the labels and activates only one part of this loss. The inputs xi and xj are now either a positive pair with the same label or a negative pair with different labels. We need to pass these data points through our model which I called m here. The output are the representations of these images. That's the time where the distance metric comes into play. Here we simply calculate the Euclidean distance between the two output representations and as we will see later there are also alternative choices for these distance measures. That's the end of the story if we have a positive pair. We simply compare their embeddings with the Euclidean distance and that's our loss function. The smaller the distance, the closer the representations. It's slightly different for negative pairs. Here we also calculate the distance but there is this max operator and also an epsilon. The basic idea is that the representations of a negative pair like a cat and a dog should be far away. We achieve that by adding a minus to the distance. The larger the distance, the more negative the loss becomes. Now we only want to reward the model to push representations away from each other once they leave some minimum distance from the original representation. And that's exactly what's expressed by this epsilon. It's a sort of margin that keeps all of the positive pairs and that's also why this loss function is sometimes called max margin loss. I've put a link into the video description in case you look for more details on this. Another popular loss is the so-called triplet loss presented by Google researchers in 2015. It's actually quite similar to the contrastive loss but instead of considering two data points as input it uses three. 
These triplets consist of an anchor, which is the original sample, and then a positive and negative data point. I've highlighted them in blue, green, and red here. With the same intuition as previously, the Euclidean distance is used to pull similar data points together and dissimilar ones apart from each other. Therefore, the actual loss terms are exactly the same as in the contrastive loss, but we get rid of the indicator function and also consider positive and negative pairs simultaneously. For a more in-depth explanation and also some nice visualizations, I've put another great blog post into the video description. Just for completeness, the triplet loss has also been extended to multiple negative pairs, which is then called n-pair loss. As you can see, there are many possibilities for contrastive losses and this is just a small fraction. Obviously, I can't capture all of them here, but I decided to talk about one more loss, which I will also use later in the PyTorch implementation. The loss function with the name NTXN was presented in 2020 in the paper SimClear, which I've briefly mentioned at the beginning of this video. The name stands for Normalized Temperature Scaled Cross Entropy and it's motivated by another loss function called InfoNCE. Just like before, we pass a positive pair XY and XJ through our model and get the embedded representations. M again represents the neural network here. NTXN uses the cosine similarity as similarity measure between the two vectors of the positive pair. The new part is that we also calculate the similarity with xy for all other pairs in the batch. That's this section in the denominator. Let's visualize this. Imagine we feed a batch of data through our model and obtain the embeddings like shown here. In total we have n data points in the batch and for each of them also a positive augmentation. That makes two n samples in total. In this example, every odd index is the original data point and every even index a positive view. What the formula above means is that we calculate the similarity between a positive pair, for example the cat image and its augmentation. And in addition to that, we also look at the similarity to all other data points in the batch. This implicitly makes all other data points negative samples. Cosine similarity is always between 0 and 1. Let's assume we get small cosine similarities with the red samples, for example they sum up to 0 0.2, and high similarity with the positive sample, say 0 0.8. With these similarities we can approximate the fraction in the formula above, and we see that the fraction gets larger if we have a larger positive similarity, or if we have a smaller similarity with the negative samples. There's a minus in front of this term, which means we want this fraction to become as big as possible in order to minimize this loss. That's the basic idea of this loss, and in addition, the authors applied the softmax function to add some normalization and the lock to soften the loss. Finally, the parameter t is called temperature and adds some scaling to the distances. To wrap this up, the variations between the loss functions are mainly the similarity measure that is used, the number of negative samples that are taken into account, and some tweaks like normalizations, margins, or scaling. The overall idea of instance discrimination is always the same. So that's it for this video. I hope this gave you a good overview on contrastive learning. The next part is all about the implementation in PyTorch, and for that, of course, we need a data set. Because there are already plenty of tutorials with image data out there, I decided to try something new this time. Therefore, we'll do contrastive learning on 3D point clouds, more specifically 3D shapes of objects, and let's see if I manage to get this working. Until then, have a great time and see you soon.